I want to start my presentation today is what do Love's Pilot Travel Center, Flying J, and Petro stops have in common? Fuel. Fuel. What else? Food. Food. Okay. <laughs> Coffee. Okay. And showers. Some right, right marks. Some showers. <laughs> so uh, what they have in common is that they are all resting stops for weary travelers, as they were over a hundred years ago. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about the village of Concordia, which I believe accessed a microcosm of early El Paso and was a stopping point, a much needed stopping point, along the trek westward. Millions of years ago, um, this is early, early El Paso history, El Paso was underwater. And when the waters receded, it left a very fertile valley, and then it also left the Rio Grande, right? And then on the left-hand side, the, that's called the Sand Hills. What was left on the other side? So these are two beaches that were left by the receding waters. On the left-hand side, the Sand Hills, and on the right-hand side is Valle de Juarez. Humans have been active in the region for many millennia. Archaeologists have found footprints, unquestionable evidence of the human presence at the White Sands National Park in New Mexico, dating between 23,000 to 21,000 years ago. Has anybody seen these footprints? No? They're incredible. I didn't bring a slide of that. I should have, but uh, they're on the riverbed. The footprints, uh, and then they got covered over, and then they got uncovered. So the footprints, can you imagine? 23,000 years ago? Uh, in what later became the El Paso Ciudad Juarez region, humans followed the Rio Grande as they traveled to north and south and into the southwest. This was the same path that railroads took when they began scouting their paths in West Texas and during westward expansion. Later in the 1800s, railroad followed the natural course of the Rio Grande. In other words, the, the course was already there. They didn't have to... Uh, create it or, 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 or just guess where they would put it. And then the Backhead Highway, which was built in 1915, which is earlier El Paso, also followed the path along the Rio Grande. And then later, the route for Interstate 10 was being considered. It also followed the Rio Grande and the railroad routes. Without roads, Native Americans made their way into present-day El Paso, Texas, thousands of years ago. Mark Thompson and historian Fred Morales writing in a 1998 archaeological report that Native Americans made their way to El Paso in southern New Mexico during the prehistoric periods to include the Paleo-Indian period, the Archaic period, the Jornada Mangolón period, the Mesilla phase, and the Doniana phase, and the El Paso phase. Early people used Native American trails to look for food and game and later to build shelter. The Keystone Heritage Park located on Donovan in West El Paso in the Keystone Dam archaeological site, also known as Site 33 or Texas Archaeological Site, contains some of the oldest human-made structures identified in the Southwest dating more than 4,500 years. Can you imagine? In 1840, Juana Escarate Stevenson and Hugh Stevenson acquired 900 acres of the Ascarate land grant, initially known as the Stevenson Settlement. The land was subsequently named, which will make Travis Bowley happy, Concordia Ranch. It was named as Concordia Ranch because Stevenson's home was in Concordia, Missouri, a city in Lafayette County, Missouri. Concordia, as we see in this, this was that version of, of, of a deed during that time. And I don't know if anybody has looked at, at deeds, but they say the land starts where the tree, uh, then a fence, and, uh, but those sites are no longer there, so I don't know how, how they do it. So this is actually uh, the land grant awarded to the Scottish by the Spanish crown in the uh, 1760s. And this is this torn up piece of paper, okay? And uh, this is a 1908 uh, Fred Sims map. You can see they're already trying uh, to subdivide the blocks. 
the Juan and Escarate um, land here, Isleta, and so forth. So uh, Hugh Stevenson and his uh, wife uh, acquired this property. Uh, they created what's called Concordia. Concordia, this was actually, Concordia included the Concordia Cemetery. Uh, it also included uh, the original cemetery, which was here. And then, uh, can someone tell me what this is here? Cordova Island? Do any of you know what Cordova Island was? The Chamizal. It was when the river shifted, it created this isthmus here. And it was protruding into the United States. So Concordia was right there at the border. Cor Cordova Island was Mexico. And for uh, many years, the dispute went back and forth. Mexico owned it, the U.S. owned it. It was a dispute. It was finally settled in 1964. 1964. So you can imagine some years you live in the U.S. and some years you live in Mexico, right? So anyway. Okay, Hugh Stevenson uh, was born in Kentucky in 1798. He arrived in the region in 1894. I tried to do the math. And so he was 26, right? And he settled in Paso del Norte, later where it became Ciudad Juarez. As the first uh, Anglo-American settlers in the region, he was a trapper, a trader, and later became a miner and a merchant. He was very versatile, what you had to be during that time. In 1828, he moved to Coralitos, Mexico, to manage a silver mine belonging to Juan and Eugenia Escarate, wealthy merchants from uh, El Paso del Norte, and owners of the Escarate land grant. Um, and then in that same year, he met and married Juana Maria Escarate, the daughter of Juan and Eugenia, right? He was pretty smart, right? He didn't waste time, right? He got that right. Anyway, so these were the boundaries of uh, Concordia. When the United States triumphed over Mexico on the, in the U.S.-Mexican War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo established the Rio Grande as a new international boundary. The annexation of the United States of Mexico's northern borderlands shaped the social economic relations between two people and cultures, according to the late Jeffrey Marcos Carlizalo. The treaty caused, caused a disruption of space all along the U.S.-Mexico border. Historian Oscar G. Martinez writes, under the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States compelled Mexico to accept the 1845 U.S. annexation of Texas and forced it to cede California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, parts of Wyoming, Kansas, and Oklahoma. That, that was a lot of land, right? The Rio Grande became half of the new international boundary with the rest consisting of that irregular line from El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, to the Pacific Ocean. That irregular line is still with us today. Can someone tell me what I mean by that irregular line? The Rio Grande, right, right. It's always shifted. The, the, the river has always had a mine of its own, right? It shifted whenever it wanted. Mother Nature and, you know, people had to adjust. In 1852, Joshua Fraser Crosby acquired part of the Ponce de Leon Grant and established Coons Ranch, three miles west of Concordia. And Anson Mills uh, platted the, the land as the a part of the El Paso Township in 1859. Anson Mills was very, uh, an interesting person too, because he was here one of the early um, people who uh, could plat, right? And so he did it. He did the first plat. In 1854, Juana Maria de Stevenson petitioned the Catholic Church in Chihuahua to establish San Jose de Acordia del Alto, which became a private church in uh, north of the Rio Grande. At the same time, uh, the Stevenson designated the boundaries of the cemetery. According to the late educator Clofas Cayero, the church was served by the parish uh, priest of Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, in Ciudad Juarez. A priest for the mission traveled to Concordia to offer services, which indicates the church served a congregation of considerable size. But unfortunately, the church did not want to uh, say a mass in 1881 because evidently someone 
uh, committed suicide and the church says, no, if you commit suicide, we can't have a service for you. Okay, by the early 1850s, this truck stop, or well, or this stop for weary travelers, Concordia Ranch, was comprised of several flat clay buildings and was distinguished by a chapel in the mode of Sp Spanish mission and the sole Catholic edifice on the North Bank. The ranch was a focus of a substantial community. Um, there were 40 families and almost 200 people tenant in Concordia, all whom farmed small plots and labored for Stevenson and the other merchants, relatives, and friends of the owners. In this period, Concordia acted as a rest stop for travelers and wagon trains heading west. And let me show you the... Uh, this is a map uh, that was uh, adapted from an 1852 Joint Boundary Commission map. As you can see here, you can see, uh, let me see, where's this? Stevenson Ranch is here. McGoffinsville is right here. And then you go down and you go to Coons. And then you have the Molino. Can someone tell me why this little town or area would be called the Molino? A mill and Hart's Mill, right? So it was basically, it had that name. And, and then both Ciudad Juarez and El Paso had basically, I don't know, acequias, which is a, a ditch that would, water would flow from the, from the Rio Grande. Uh, from the Rio Grande, it would flow. And so uh, these acequias were important because how else are you going to water your crops? How else are you going to get water to your animals? I don't know, maybe uh, uh, water for bathing, right? They didn't have uh, plumbing, they didn't have a sewer system and all that. And so, uh, so here you have, you have El Paso Norte, which became Ciudad Juarez. Here's the Acequia Madre in uh, Ciudad Juarez. This is the road to Chihuahua. And then here is another area called La Isla. Has anybody heard of La Isla? La Isla is basically an island an island in La Isla. I know someone who's kind of like a clairvoyant and she uh, connects real strongly to La Isla. I think for those of you that live in El Paso, she's eventually gonna have a, a tour here. But this is, this is early El Paso. This is what was early El Paso during this period. So uh, these were, these towns shaping, taking shape, uh, uh, Stevensville there, you have Paso Norte, Frontera. So this is an early San Elisario, Socorro. So here you see these towns emerging. Uh, and this was actually taken from uh, uh, the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress has uh, a lot of really interesting, let me see if I could find the, this one. This is a detailed map of El Paso County. You can see, uh, first and foremost, the river here. And then you see it being subdivided, subdivided. And then here you have Old Fort Bliss. Recently, I was talking to Gary Williams from the Community Foundation, and he says, we have the order of the forts wrong. Did he tell you that? There's, there's actually, the first Fort Bliss was not uh, Hart's Mill, it's, it's yeah, it's it's one closer to McGoffinsville, right? Right. Yeah, because right. we were at Old Fort Bliss yesterday. Yeah. And that's the third, I believe. Yes, it's the third. So, uh, so the history has been wrong, right? And it needs to be corrected. So, okay, uh, I I think next I'm going to go on to the slides. Uh, in 1854, um, again, uh, Juana Maria de Escarate petitioned the church to establish. San Jose Concordia del Alto, the first private church north of the Rio Grande. So um, this was the first uh, private church north of the Rio Grande. This was a spire. This is where uh, e eventually uh, Juana Maria de Escarete was buried. So he, it's in proximity. So this was the fr first private Catholic church. Camp Concordia was also known as Fuerte Azul because the barracks were painted blue. Uh, in, uh, and four years later, in 1868, Mocafesio was flooded, and then they established Camp Concordia. 
uh, which is not the third for bliss, right? We gotta change the order now that we, uh, right? This is an illustration of Concordia Post in 1868, uh, based by a painting by Colonel uh, Fountain. And so you see adobe. Adobe is pretty quaint. It wasn't, uh, uh, this, this, were, this was also where the Buffalo Soldiers were stationed. Unfortunately, there was a lot of malaria in that area because of the river. The river was close by. And so uh, some of the Buffalo Soldiers did not fare well. And so, um, so this, this, uh, these are the remnants of Camp Concordia. This is a, uh, used to be the Falstaff Brew House, Camp Concordia Fuerte Azul. And in his article, Hugh Stevenson, in, in the article on Hugh Stevenson, uh, James McGuffin Dwyer indicates the barracks were located where the Mitchell Brewing Company now stands. So it's still standing. Are you going to have a tour of uh, that, that brewing company? No? Okay, so this is actually remnants of Camp Concordia, if you can believe that. So, uh, and it's right there at the corner of uh, Frutas and Ladder Streets. And, and the building now is a loft for artists. So this is El Paso circa 1915. When the creation, before the creation of the Bankhead Highway, can someone tell me what the Bankhead Highway was? Right, it was the first uh, uh, nationwide highway that started east and traveled all through the southern states mostly. And um, I often ask my students, because I incorporate a lot of this early El Paso into my teaching history, U.S. history, and I ask my students, as I'll ask you, wait, I'm getting away from the microphone. Well, uh, as I ask you, who was the labor pool for the Bankhead Highway? We could go back and ask ourselves, who was the labor pool for the railroads? Can someone tell me who the labor pool was? Chinese, Chinese. okay. And the uh, Irish. And who was the labor pool for the Bankhead Highway? Think about it. This was around the, uh, around the time of the Mexican Revolution, I think Mexicans were too busy fleeing Mexico to be working on the railroad, right? Can someone tell me? Who, who was the labor pool? Yes? No, it wasn't the Chinese. Because they had already passed, in 19, they had already passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? So the Chinese could not hold those jobs. So who was it? Just military? No, not military. African Americans. And you know why? The Bankhead Highway was mostly built in the southern states. And African Americans, they used the convict labor system. Remember, after Reconstruction, uh, if you were black and you did not have a job, guess what they did to you? They put you in prison. So uh, during Reconstruction, the prison population overnight went from being 90, 100% white to 90, 100% black. They were in prison because they didn't have jobs. And so they were used in the southern states all the way across to uh, construct it. And I have a photo of that as well, but I didn't include it, you know. Are you calling <laughs> it the Beckett Highway? The Bankhead. Bankhead. It's named after uh, a senator that introduced the bill and so forth. And then he got his buddies all, all along the southern states to provide free labor or cheap labor. USA, and there's also, for those of you that are interested in our social media, there's a Bankhead Highway group on Facebook. So Concordia during this period was like the truck stops that we see today. Uh, people could stop there and get their horses shoed. Uh, they could get, grab a bite to eat. They could stay overnight. They could have a shower. They could go to this chapel and pray for the journey westward. So it was a private church. That's a private church, as opposed to a church that everybody else could attend. This is Concordia, 1940 to 1930. You have another group of people that um, came to work. And I, I've talked to, uh, uh, during this time, um, African-Americans uh, became porters in the rail car uh, system. And they, they had unions and they were able to work because, you know, the Chinese were excluded. 
uh, the Mexicans during this period were no uh, shape or, or form to be able to perform the service. So, uh, and can somebody see, uh, has somebody read recently? Did, can someone tell me what this building is? The Union Depot, right? And that's where the new sports park is going to be built, right? The arena, they're going to build an arena. But, but, but this basically gives you time and place. This is uh, the, the Union Depot. This was, uh, these were porters and they were loading uh, food or whatever for uh, the passengers. So uh, uh, buildings and as far as the urban environment are important because it gives people time and place.